God by James Smythe. Have you ever thought about going out for a run, says Ted, stretching his groin right there in front of me on the living room carpet. <laughs> Just a short one, up and down the hill a couple of times. He takes huge, dramatic breaths in through the nose and out through the mouth and starts jogging on the spot, lifting his knees up as though he's trying to connect with his own chin. Probably do you the world of good. I sigh and gargle and down a banana milkshake. I might as well get this out of the way right now. I am a fat man. There's no two ways about it. I'm not big boned or chubby or cuddly or even, if only, chunky. <laughs> I am fat. Very fat. So fat that the Teds of the world see it as their mission to rally round and save me from a life of morbid, maudlin obesity. And it's not just him who stretches his groin on my living room carpet. Oh no, there are others. George from round the corner. He must be pushing 70 and he does it. Dean, the skinny lad from the dry cleaners, he does it. In fact, the more I think about it, the more of them there are, coming round here at all hours of the day and night, hassling me about losing weight and getting fit. All of them stretching their groins on my carpet. <laughs> it's enough to drive you around the twist. I'm not in the mood for saying grumpily, Iron up some chocolate buttons I've seen on the mantelpiece. <laughs> but it's a beautiful day, cries Ted, flinging out his arms. Look at the sky! Look at what you're missing! Imagine that air in your lungs! I look out the window, it's mostly grey. <laughs> with a few patches of blue sky. Ted must, I imagine, be focusing on those blue patches. One of his positive thinking things. <laughs> Looks like rain, I say. Rubbish, says Ted. He takes a step forward and prods me in the belly. My belly, with a shudder, takes it up to the second knuckle. <laughs> it's all in your mind, you know. All this fat. You think it's part of you, but it isn't. Oh, dear me, no. He shakes his head condescendingly, and I want to bite it off. <laughs> you can think yourself thin, if only you think positively. After all, look at me. He stands back and thrusts out his pigeon chest, planting this thin white gnarled legs much further apart than is comfortable for both of us. <laughs> the very epitome of manhood. I grunt. I shift on the sofa, which is always uncomfortable. My stomach gurgles volcanically, and I experience it not so much as a sound, but as a vibration. The ornaments on the mantelpiece tinkle. <laughs> Sympathetically. <laughs> I haven't eaten a proper meal for an hour. <laughs> that is not just your health I'm talking about, says Ted. He leans forward theatrically and winks a sickly blue eye at me. Just think of the ladies. You think you're gonna get any action looking like that? It prods me in the stomach again. I tell you, my friend, there's nothing like skirt there's nothing the skirt like more than a live, firm, athletic body. It bespeaks support. It bespeaks agility. It bespeaks stamina. <laughs> and then he turns around and touches his toes, almost as though he actually wants me to get a good look at his arse. <laughs> <laughs> and what action have you been getting lately, Ted? I say. Ted is a widower of five years, and godlike body aside, I can't imagine the young ladies of the village going in for liver spots and a faint whiff of age in desperation. <laughs> Ted snorts derisively. You've seen the way Mrs. Lonsdale looks at me, he says with a sneer. I see her at the window every morning when I go past. The girl is hot for me, I've no doubt. Girl, I say. Mrs. Lonsdale's got to be pushing 90. <laughs> well, you know what they say, Wig said. The older the dame, the hotter the flame. <laughs> you are. <laughs> <laughs> That isn't a saying. <laughs> well, whatever, says Ted, stretching his groin one more time for good measure. I don't have time to stand around here wasting time with the likes of you. That 5k won't run itself, will it? Sure you don't want to come on? Positive thinking, drop a few pounds, regain just a little bit of self-esteem. I sigh. Fuck off. <laughs> Fair enough, says Ted. 
trotting towards the door. Don't say I didn't warn you. When you're lying in a hospital bed being fed on a drip after a massive and ultimately fatal coronary seizure. Cheerio now. And he's gone. For a while I make the most of the silence. You've got to give Ted that. He really helps you enjoy your own company. <laughs> but after about half an hour, I start to get really hungry and head to the kitchen for sustenance. There's a Swiss roll in the cupboard and I devour it in two bites. Then I have two bowls of cornflakes, a Cornish pasty, a pound of grated cheddar and a box of Ferrero Rocher. <laughs> And after that, I start to feel better. <laughs> Pausing only to make a disturbing visit to the toilet, I pull on my enormous leather jacket and head out of the house. Now, I know that Ted enjoys labouring under the misapprehension that I'm a shut-in. He thinks I exist on pizza delivery and mail-order toilet rolls. <laughs> but then, it amuses him to think that. I'm actually far more mobile than a letter on, although I don't really work. I mean, who's going to employ this? I do try to get out of the house at least once a day, alright, so I get stared at in the street and sometimes worse. And true, when I get home my heart is hammering in my chest and it takes me a good two hours to convince myself that I'm not about to die. <laughs> but somehow it all seems worth it. And I'll tell you why. My house is a five minute walk from a bridge. And it's a very long, very high bridge. The arches wall, maybe <coughs> 200 feet across a valley, and beneath which, far beneath, runs the major road that runs into the village. And there's a bench on that bridge, which overlooks the road and the village, and further out in the distance, the surrounding towns. London itself sits sparkling on the horizon, and there's hardly ever anyone sitting on that bench. And even if there is, they soon move when I plant my lumbering carcass beside them. <laughs> So that's where I go when I leave the house. It sounds silly, but it's there that I feel like a god. Like a big, fat, leather-jacketed Buddha. <laughs> Overseeing the comings and goings of the tiny creatures that crawl beneath me. They can't see me, of course, on my lofty perch. They can't laugh and point or do hilarious waddling impersonations. They can't regard me with undisguised contempt. They can't be disgusted. Instead, this time, it's I who is laughing at them. When an odious white van rear-ends an innocent commuter on the notoriously busy roundabout, I point a roar with mirth. <laughs> when an old lady trips over a dog's lead and spills her groceries halfway down the hill, I can barely stifle my amusement. <laughs> when an over-enthusiastic skateboarder trying to impress a girl flips himself headfirst into a concrete billboard, my hilarity knows no bounds. <laughs> but that's not to say I'm an unfeeling Dale to <laughs> On occasion, with a peremptory gesture of my sausage fingers, I will redirect a stray dog back to its owner. I'll, I'll help a, a struggling mother with her wind-ravaged umbrella. If I'm feeling particularly potent, I might, by reaching out with a huge invisible hand, steady the wobbling ice cream of a, a child, oh, sorry, wobbling crown of a child's ice cream, if it's about to fall. <coughs> Sad, I suppose. But this is the only way I feel I can fit into the world. You might call it delusions of grandeur, but in my case it's, it's the only delusion that makes sense. Why should I wobble through the crowds to be pushed and, and poked and, and prodded when I can sit here in the anonymity of my omniscience? Why should I be an object of ridicule when here the subjects of my world are mere playthings, here for my amusement? Why must I sit vegetating on my sofa while Ted stretches his groin on my living room carpet? I sit on the bench and eat a family-sized pack of Prawn cocktail crisps. Today I feel quite benevolent and quite content to observe my world without the need to employ any of my diversionary interventions. The cars on this cold morning crawl past, half of them still with their headlights on in the morning mist. A few people in heavy overcoats with, with bags and briefcases struggle up the hill. The trees that line the roadside rustle 
I imagine, in humble tribute to my unknowable power. To amuse myself, I, I blink my eyes and the wind switches direction, helping the travellers up the hill. Their eyes momentarily cast skyward, filled with gratitude. I nod and smile. <laughs> Something hits me on the back of the head, it's cold and hard, and I see moments later that it's an empty Coke can. You is well fat, innit? <laughs> says a voice. And I turn to see three children, all in hoodies, standing a few feet away. I cough in surprise, and, and this turns into a coughing fit that lasts a good 90 seconds. The kids stand there in disgust until, with tears in my eyes, I manage to control myself. What do you want? I say, as manfully as I can. Why is you so fat, man? Says one of them. It was disgusting, yeah? Because you've got no self-respect. Yeah, look at your ass, man, says another. Don't even fit on the bench, innit? <laughs> I've nothing to say. I'm used to this. You'd think I'd have a line by now, but no, I have nothing to say. <laughs> the kids gather in a sort of huddle. I can't really hear what they're saying, but one phrase, urgent and delighted, pops out. He can't run after us! <laughs> <laughs> And a second later, they're on me. A hand grabs my hair and another slaps my face and I hear the fizz of the drinks bottle being opened and, and then it's all over me. The stinging in my eyes and, and spilling down inside my collar and something sharp stabs me in the side of my neck as I wince away. I feel one of them tug at my shoes, which, being slip-ons, come off easily. And then they're gone, shrieking and cackling and I'm left alone, sticky and sore and shoeless. In shock. I can't move, and all I can think is, I am no god. I have no power. This world, with its cars and its people and its comings and goings, isn't anything to do with me. And I am nothing to do with it. And in a daze, I stand up and I move forwards. The railings of the bridge only come up to my waist. It's a struggle, but I managed to get over. The ledge on the other side is thin, and the road looks very, very far away. I know it won't be long before I lose my balance anyway, so I jump. And all of a sudden, I'm flying. <coughs> the ground is coming at me fast, but, but in that moment, I don't care. I spread my arms, and, and I, I dip my head, and, and the wind rolls past my ears. I, I feel light. I, I feel weightless. The, the people below, my people, aren't aware, aware of me. My subjects don't know that their Lord, their God, their Buddha, is about to pay them a surprise visit. <sighs> I find myself laughing, screaming even with joy. I don't think I've ever felt so happy. I realise that here, now, even if it's only for a second or two, is where I belong, soaring through the sky, swooping with the birds airborne. It's only at the last moment that I look up and I see Ted. <laughs> Stopping up the hill, panting for breath. Our trajectories look like they're about to meet. Like destiny. <laughs> His head is down and he doesn't see me. I pray for him to look up. I will him to look up. The pavement rushes towards me. Ted stumbles directly into my line of fire. He looks up. His eyes don't even have time to register anything.